Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Mac Haddo, Senior Fellow on Public Policy with the American Kratom Association, and we welcome everyone to this webinar this afternoon to talk about Kratom, Kratom policy and a science update that is particularly of interest to many state legislators and public policymakers at local and state jurisdictions. And we thought it was very important to provide the opportunity for those policymakers to have some background on Kratom as you start to look at potential regulatory frameworks that will protect Kratom consumers. The AKA is a consumer organization. We do not represent vendors and we act on behalf of consumers to ensure that they have access to safe Kratom consumer products. This webinar today is designed to provide the kind of information and I'd like to make introductions of everyone that is joining us here in the call. Then we'll do a background on the history of Kratom. We'll talk about the current status of Kratom regulation in the United States. We'll have the benefit of a science update from some knowledgeable scientific experts, and then we'll talk about next steps. So by, by way of introduction, we have joining us today, uh, Professor Jack Henningfield, who is a professor of ad adjunct behavioral uh, biology at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and formerly was with the National Institutes on Drug Abuse for decades. Uh, Dr. Marilyn Eustace of Thomas Jeff Jefferson University and the president of Eustace and Smith Toxicology, and also was a former chief chemistry and drug metabolism expert at NIDA for 23 years. And we have James Carroll, who's currently with Michael Best and Friedrich Consulting and was the former drug czar at the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, and we welcome at here at AK all of these individuals. In addition, we have joining us today uh, three state legislators who have been invited to participate and to ask questions of these experts as it is appropriate during the presentation. So they have uh, all of the privileges to interrupt and clarify information that's being presented. We have Senator Kurt Bramble of the state of Utah, who was the first sponsor of the Kratom Consumer Protection Act at the state level and truly was the pioneer in the developing a, an appropriate state regulatory framework for Kratom. Senator, a, a representative and President Pro Tem of the uh, Rhode Island House of Representatives and the president-elect of the uh, National Conference of State Legislators is also joining us. Uh, Rhode Island is a state where Kratom is currently banned in the United States, one of six states that reacted to advice from the Food and Drug Administration between 2012 and 2017 that encouraged states to ban Kratom on the premise that it would be scheduled imminently by the Drug Enforcement Administration, which of course has not happened. And then hopefully we'll have Representative Chris, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Chris, Christopher, Phil Cristofanelli of the state of Missouri, who's a member of the House of Representatives and a sponsor of the KCA bill, the KCPA bill, which will be considered in the Missouri legislature in this upcoming legislative session. So to get started, we'll talk about what Kratom is. Kratom is a tropical evergreen tree and a member of the coffee family that is native to Southeast Asia. It also is grown in appropriate tropical environments in the United States, which includes Hawaii and Florida. In a recent trip to Hawaii, I discovered that there is a Kratom Farmers Association that has been formed as this fledgling industry grows because of the appropriate climate in the state of Hawaii. Historically, Kratom leaves were chewed frequently by workers to get through Hot, long, hard days in, in the, on the fields and working, gave them energy, and it's brewed as a tea and was being con, uh, uh, used and consumed as a food staple by people in Southeast Asia. Currently, the largest worldwide Kratom supplier is Indonesia, but they are now being uh, rapidly overtaken by Thailand, Malaysia, and Africa uh, as, as new demand for Kratom raw materials increases across the globe uh, we're seeing a significant increase in production of Kratom pro products. Thailand is also investing heavily in Kratom regulation and infrastructure because last year they completely de decriminalized Kratom and currently they're working on de developing a supply chain for safe Kratom raw materials. Many ask how and why Kratom is consumed. Uh, it is used by about a third of the population based on the study that was done by Dr. Grunman back in 2017, examining consumer behaviors with respect to the use of Kratom. Uh, 
about a third of the respondents said they used it as a replacement for coffee to increase their energy and focus during the day. Some at little higher doses used it to, to reduce anxiety and depression and at even higher doses to reduce acute and chronic pain. Interestingly, science has found that many people are successfully using Kratom to decrease the use of drugs with more dangerous, replacing with more dangerous safety and addiction profiles for the drugs that they may be consuming that, for pain relief, that they're able to use Kratom to replace that. And obviously that is a harm reduction tool that's very attractive from a public policy standpoint as we grapple with the drug overdose crisis that is sweeping the United States. The, in, the, in the United States, Kratom consumers identified initially with Kratom, uh, with soldiers coming back from the war that brought Kratom home, and they used it while they were out in the hot jungles in Southeast Asia for energy and minor pain relief to get through the day. There was also, immediately following uh, the war in the 70s and 80s, an influx of Hmong immigrants that came to the United States who have traditionally used Kratom as a part of their conventional diet. And of course, that's important as we look at the criteria that is required by the FDA to determine whether or not a, a substance is grandfathered in as generally recognized as safe, as safe based on use prior to 1994 in the United States, of which Kratom clearly meets that criteria. Today, there are 12 to 15 million Kratom consumers in the United States, and about two and a half million are using Kratom actively to replace dangerous and addictive pain medications, which as I mentioned is a very important harm reduction tool. Kratom regulation. As Kratom prevalence has increased, this is a botanical with a safe history of over decades in Southeast Asia. There hasn't been a single reported fatality related to uh, Kratom alone in Southeast Asia, and it's seen an increasing popularity in the United States particularly since the FDA started its war on Kratom in 2016, which in a perverse way drew more attention to Kratom and allowed consumers to uh, both identify and discover the health benefits of using Kratom, particularly those that are struggling with acute and chronic pain and opioid use disorder. The opioid em epidemic in the United States, as we all know, worsened as the FDA's precautionary principle for considering opioid properties did not fully consider the adverse public health risk of scheduling Kratom and its public health benefits. And so while the FDA tried to initiate scheduling activity with Kratom, it was unsuccessful. The American people, however, expect action. And obviously that drove a lot of what the FDA's thinking was with respect to, to uh, Kratom. People want the government to intervene to curb the opioid epidemic. We know that last year there were nearly 107,000 deaths from drug overdoses, the highest in the history of the United States, and obviously we need to do something. The FDA's response was to propose scheduling of Kratom. They, they argued that the proposed scheduling was based on gaps in the Kratom scientific and safety data, despite the growing and mounting evidence that they ignored at the time. And so today we have a regulatory timeline, which as I mentioned earlier, where the FDA was claiming to states between 2012 and 2017, that they were going to secure an imminent, imminent federal scheduling under the Controlled Substances Act with the D Drug Enforcement Administration. Six states reacted to the FDA advice and they enacted Kratom bans. And it was all based on the FDA lobbying activity, Alabama, Arkansas, Indiana, Wisconsin, Vermont, and Rhode Island adopted various forms of Kratom bans, and they continue to exist to this day, although there are reevaluations going on in many of those states. All of this, this activity was based on inaccurate FDA data that was republished by numerous medical groups and adopted by them as though it were fact. That includes, unfortunately, the Mayo Clinic, WebMD, and the Cleveland Clinic. Many of those web platforms have agreements with the FDA to automatically republish any of the data that the FDA distributes. And importantly, it should be recognized that none of those groups have independently done a shred of research into Kratom themselves. They have relied completely on the statements by the FDA, which we'll describe here later, has been contested by numerous federal officials and uh, scientists or experts in this field.
We also know that the medical associations and some law enforcement groups have repeated the inaccurate information about Kratom that has been disseminated by the FDA. And by the way, that's understandable. We as Americans all expect that the FDA would be the gold standard in protecting the public health of Americans. And most of the time they get it right, but there have been significant times when the FDA has been wrong and they certainly are wrong when it comes to their efforts to regulate Kratom. In 2016, the FDA submitted its first of two submissions to schedule Kratom under the emergency power section of the Controlled Substances Act. The Drug Enforcement Administration responding to an outcry from consumers, concerns by medical professionals, law enforcement professionals, veterans groups, and congressional uh, and, uh, uh, individuals there, and, and which included 51 members of Congress, uh, 26 Republicans and 25 Democrats, and 13 members of the United States Senate. And to give you an idea of the philosophical or partisan split, you had Bernie Sanders on one hand from the state of Vermont, arguably one of the most liberal members of the United States Senate, and at the time, Senator Orrin Hatch, one of the most conservative members who joined in a letter to the Drug Enforcement Administration asking them to decline to schedule Kratom based on the science and the procedures that are required under the Controlled Substances Act that requires rigorous standards to be met. And on October 13th of 2016, the DEA, based on inadequate information provided by the FDA, withdrew the scheduling request. The first time in an unprecedented action that, the, uh, that in fact the DEA had withdrawn a scheduling request that had been made by the FDA for a, a controlled substance. In 2017, the FDA renewed with a more complete resume and a document known as the eight-factor analysis, which is supposed to be a complete analysis and a recording of all published literature on, in this case, Kratom, and that was submitted uh, to the Drug Enforcement Administration. And on October the 16th of 2018, the Assistant Secretary of Health, Dr. Brett Chua, in a scathing rebuke to the FDA, withdrew that scheduling recommendation in, in citing in numerous uh, issues with the credibility, uh, the, the emerging science that contradicted the FDA's position, and essentially the lack of evidence, which he called and characterized as disappointingly poor evidence and data. He withdrew the scheduling uh, request from the, the F, from the DEA and told the FDA that they had to meet some standards before they could ever approach again a scheduling request for Kratom. Then the third strike came to the FDA when they made an attempt in lobbying to the UN Commission on Narc Narcotic Drugs asking for international scheduling. And in this case, one of the WHO uh, uh, experts who was asked to evaluate the request by the US FDA and some other countries that had been recruited by the FDA to, uh, to actually influence the Expert Committee on Drug Dependence, which evaluates all scheduling recommendations by the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs. They, were, they, they characterized what the FDA provided as throwing everything but the kitchen sink. And the FDA did that. There was no question that the FDA was looking to find a safe place for their scheduling recommendation. And this one was a good one for them because in fact, the, uh, the international standard for scheduling is far less than that is required in the United States. But despite that, on December 1st of 2021, the Expert Committee on Drug Dependence concluded unanimously that there was insufficient evidence to recommend even a critical review of Kratom, which would have triggered a one-year review by international experts across the world to determine whether or not the criteria for scheduling at the international level, level was met. The expert committee determined there wasn't even enough evidence to do that, that in fact the evidence was insufficient, and that should have been the end of the discussion when it comes to whether or not the evidence and data that supports any scheduling recommendation was being met. In response to the continued and persistent effort by the FDA to, dis to disseminate inaccurate disinformation about Kratom, uh, Senator Mike Lee of Utah and Representative Mark Pocan of Wisconsin jointly wrote to the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, Secretary Becerra, and asked him how he could justify the continued efforts by the FDA to ban Kratom. The response was specific. It said, while options for scheduling have been discussed, we believe that additional data and information are needed 
to understand the public health impact of Kratom in terms of the therapeutic benefits as well as its safety risks. And then he pointed out with which torpedoes the FDA's persistent claims about the safety that many Kratom-involved overdose deaths have occurred after the use of adulterated Kratom products or taking Kratom with other illicit substances. This is the heart of the issue because the FDA hangs its hat on their claims that Kratom is unsafe. And here, when independent reviews are made by public health officials, they find the, the evidence presented by the FDA to be inadequate. The consequences of scheduling are significant. If you, if you enact a scheduling ban, the food safety standards that are required under various statutes at the federal level go ignored. That's why we find the salmonella outbreak from contaminants in Kratom in 2018 occurred because the FDA was consumed with banning Kratom raw materials coming into the United States. And this is what happens when you enact those kinds of bans. Senator Cory Booker, Corey, Corey Booker from New Jersey, who is a great advocate for decriminalization of drug policy in the United States, pointed out in his support for withdrawing the uh, scheduling recommendation from the FDA that the effect would be that consumers would be arrested, imprisoned, or lose child custody. And in fact, six states have passed laws restricting Kratom, including criminal penalties, and we at the AK have had to be involved in numerous child custody cases to present the science to show courts in those states where it is banned that in fact the the characterization of Kratom by the FDA and by those state authorities is incorrect. And tragically, we find in the state of Arkansas that an individual was, was arrested and convicted of possessing Kratom for his own personal use and was, it was sentenced to 10 years in prison, which is the lowest sentence that was available to the jury to award to that individual. Sadly, that individual was, uh, was killed several weeks later while in custody. None of that would have happened if the FDA's disinformation about Kratom had been ignored by the state of Arkansas. And we're hoping that we can change that law in Arkansas soon. The other consequence of scheduling is you get complete economic stagnation. Credit processors reject the payments because they say that the, the FDA claims Kratom is dangerous. It limits investment in manufacturing and businesses. It stunts trade and industry growth. We know after visiting Indonesia, which is the largest export of Kratom raw materials, that the Indonesian government is concerned about the 200,000 Indonesian families who, would, who are currently suffering from the FDA import alerts and who would be decimated by any ban that would be enacted. And the Thai government is seeking now to invest substantial resources into Kratom farming and appropriate supply chain regulations, all of which will go away if banning were to be implemented. And on research barriers, it is well understood and regularly re the, uh, the director of the department, uh, or I'm sorry, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, Nora Volko, reminds the Congress that if you enact bans, there will be no Kratom research because the supply of pharmaceutical grade Kratom would dry up. The potential solutions to the opioid epidemic would then go unexplored. And we know that the current science, it's a science that's ongoing, which undermines the case made by the FDA and supports regulations on Kratom that are responsibly done is the correct pathway to go. At the American Kratom Association, we strongly advocate that science should dictate public policy on Kratom, not the biases, the long-standing biases of a regulatory agency like the FDA that simply does not like botanical products. They favor new drug applications. They don't like the ability of consumers to make informed decisions about their health and well-being. They want to make them for them. And so at this point, what I would like to do is invite our scientific panel, Dr. Marilyn Eustace and Dr. Jack Henningfield, to step in and talk about, I'm sorry, we're first going to go to, uh, uh, to Jim Carroll, the former drug czar, to talk about the regulatory framework and how science should inform that, and then we'll come back and go to, uh, to the scientists. So Jim, I'll turn it over to you. You have to unmute yourself, Jim. I apologize. Um, thank you, Mac, and thank you everyone for joining this presentation today. As Mac indicated, I'm the former director of the agency known as the Office of National Drug Control Policy. It's an office inside the White House with about 100 professionals overseeing the $35 billion that the federal government spends on drug issues. So my office oversaw the policy around all of the addiction, treatment, prevention, as well as controlling the supply of illicit drugs coming into the United States. 
I promised to run that office in a nonpartisan way and was very fortunate to be unanimously confirmed and served in that capacity for three years. While I was there, letting science and reason dictate what was important, for the first time in 29 years, we had a reduction in the number of fatal overdoses in our country. By following the science, we can also see the importance of the ability to research Kratom. And that's what I really wanted to sort of talk about today, not only as the former US drugs are, but also as a parent of a child who is in recovery from a dependence on opioids. So I speak to you in many fashions today, wearing both hats. What we know, and when you look at the slides, is there are, if you just do an initial look, an initial search, you might see that there are some very scary concerns out there. We recognize that. But what you need to do is to actually look at the science, look at the facts that are around us. And what we see, and it's pointed out on slide 16, that the FDA, who as Mac indicated, um, has um, severe concerns about Kratom to say the least, are actually, I would argue, as assisting on this, that it's not well-founded at all. The FDA reports that the Kratom associated deaths appear to have resulted from adulterated products. The very thing that the American Kratom Association wants to do is to have a safe, a supply of Kratom. It goes on to say that the Kratom injuries, um, deaths that have been associated with the product have all actually been contaminated with other, usually a completely illicit products. And again, that goes to the safety concern that I have in terms of not um, of making this a banned product. What we know is in fact, the product that is will be out there is in fact the dangerous product that can be combined with other illicit substances. Moving on to slide 17 and talking about the work done at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, which I know um, Marilyn and Jack will talk about in greater detail. NIDA is the premier agency within the federal government that looks at the issues of helping people, which we estimate to be about 20 million Americans suffering from the disease of addiction in our country and making sure that we are providing as a government the most effective, the best possible treatment that is out there and also looking forward, looking ahead to make sure that we can research all new possibilities of what could actually help those with an addiction. And the concern has been, is Kratom addictive? Again, go back to NIH, or excuse me, NIDA, NIDA, and you can see that it does not have the abuse potential that people discuss about it. The facts, the science that we know, it does not indicate any abuse potential of itself. And in fact, what it actually shows is the potential for treatment to specifically reduce opioid abuse. When at the time we're currently facing, as Max said, the highest number of fatal overdoses in our history, almost all caused by opioids, by fentanyl and other drugs coming into our country, this shows the potential by NIDA, the agency in the federal government that actually dictates this issue, that there is the great potential for this to be a helpful product. And I think really in one of the most powerful slides for me is the next slide with a picture of a friend to many of us on this call, uh, Dr. Nora Volkoff, the director of NIDA, the National Institute for Drug Abuse. Dr. Nida ha Dr. Volkoff has to be one of the most highly decorated physicians in our country in this area. She has served as the director of NIDA for approximately 20 years. Nora, has published or co-published over 800 articles on addiction and treatment. She was the person that we turned to at the White House when we needed data, when we needed science, and we needed a facts on what was the best way to treat Americans, to save American lives. 
And in her testimony that was given just on May 17, 2022, you can see that what she talks about is that Kratom, let's see at the end of her quote there, Kratom could be used for decreasing withdrawal or depression. It's essentially, it is one of the, it is, produces an effect similar to the medication that is given to people who are at first entering treatment. They're first entering a detox facility to help them through their very difficult withdrawal. And in fact, we know that one of the reasons that people don't seek treatment for their addiction is because they know the withdrawal can be so difficult, so painful. And Dr. Volkoff has actually come out and said, this can help. We're not saying that Kratom is the magic cure-all, that Kratom is going to fix everything. What we're saying is that it has great promise. What we're saying is the research shows that this has the potential to save lives. And the research and the facts also show that there is not the ability to really abuse Kratom as long as it is safe, which is something that we are all fighting for, is to make sure that consumers have access to safe Kratom. What we're trying to do is make sure that the research is able to go on, that people who are currently using this to help them can proceed down a path which will allow them the ability to restore their lives. And again, in a bipartisan, perhaps nonpartisan way, even President Biden has joined on this. With the appropriations that were signed just um, a few days ago on December the 26th, 2022, the president signed the Appropriations Act, which says Kratom, the combining, combating opioid overdoses. The committee commends NIDA for funding studies on Kratom based on promising results that unadulterated, meaning the pure and safe that AKA is fighting for, may provide help for the Americans struggling with addiction. This is what we're fighting for. This, these are the lives that we are trying to save. Not only my child, but the children of our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, and our colleagues. So I commend all of you for attending, listening to this presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Mac, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jim. And, uh, and now uh, I think that the most important issue that we face on a daily basis in responding to questions about Kratom is, what is the current science? And uh, we had Dr. Henningfield and Dr. Eustace, along with Dr. Garcia Romeo and Dr. Grunman, did a Kratom science update, which we invite everyone to take the time to read and which will be made available to all state legislators and local public policy officials on Kratom, because it gives you the update in real time, published in October of 22. But I'm going to turn it over to both Jack Henningfield and Marilyn Eustace to walk us through what the current science is, what it reveals about Kratom, and how you as a public official might want to integrate the scientific uh, evidence and data that's available now into a regulatory scheme that assures consumer access to safe Kratom products. So Jack, I'll turn it to you. You bet. Thank you, Mac. And I uh, really appreciate Jim Carroll's comments because he demonstrated uh, well at the White House that science-guided policy can really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Husus and I have been doing this, in, involved in this for decades. I've been involved in, in this kind of research for a half a century now. In addition to my position at Hopkins, I had uh, abuse liability assessment at Penny Associates. And part of what I do is work on new medicines, dietary supplements, evaluating their abuse potential, make scheduling recommendations to the Food and Drug Administration. Before that, at NIDA, I headed the section since 1985 that was established in 1985 to advise FDA and DEA on drug scheduling. So this is basically what I do. Now, at Johns Hopkins in my department, one of my colleagues, Dr. Albert Garcia, led a study, a survey, a national internet survey, which went beyond the Grunman survey earlier and complemented another survey that my own group did. And what he found is as he focused on comparing Kratom with opioids, that Kratom is largely used 
not so much by um, by the usual drug recreational drug using population that you think about, but mainly uh, it, it cuts across the swath of America, but with the largest numbers, white middle-aged Americans who are using it for pain, anxiety, depression, and so forth, as Mac mentioned earlier. What he found is that for those that had opioid use histories, many of them were turning to Kratom to get off of opioids. And what they found is that most of them found that it provided a manageable way to relieve opioid withdrawal. And really importantly, many of them then were able to get off of opioids. And so this was self-management and that's what makes it a valuable asset in the opioid crisis. It's a lifeline for many people away from opioids. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that NIDA did was start funding a lot of research. It had been funding research on uh, Kratom's uh, alkaloids as possible new pain medicines and for other purposes for the last decade or more. But in about 2015 and 16 and 17, it really ramped up support. And the leading laboratory in the world right now is at the University of Florida, headed by Dr. Christopher McCurdy. And they have published dozens and dozens of studies. And in fact, in total, there's more than 100 new studies related to Kratom safety and addiction potential and potential use to combat the opioid crisis since 2017. Uh, as you can see in a recent uh, NIH record interview, uh, Dr. McCurdy stated bluntly, we know that very few deaths are credited to Kratom product alone. And though, and, and the, where we do see deaths, it, most of those involve other substances or contaminated products. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Hustis and another colleague, Dr. Uh, Mr. Wang and I did an update of Kratom abuse potential. And we followed the same approach that DEA and FDA and NIDA do on evaluating abuse potential. It's called an eight factor analysis and it's written into law into the Controlled Substances Act. So we took the same approach, which we've done before, and looked at more than 100 new Kratom-related studies since 2016. And in brief, what we found is that the abuse potential of Kratom is very low. It does not merit scheduling. And in fact, that scheduling would create problems that do not presently exist. So in most states, Kratom is not scheduled, but scheduling would essentially ban it. And that would essentially create a national uh, a black market for Kratom, where the only Kratom that would be available would be unregulatable Kratom. And that would greatly worsen the problems that we already have. Uh, one of the things that, that is evident from the research is that nature got it right. The balance of alkaloids in natural kratom uh, provides benefits to people with very little risk. But when you mess with it and adulterate it and don't properly handle it and let it get contaminated, you get problems. That's why we need it to be regulated. Next slide, please. Now, a lot of people think, well, Kratom is an opioid or it must be an opioid because it helps with opioids. But a lot, of a lot of drugs are helpful to people and a lot of substances are helpful to people to get off of opioids. In fact, the most recent drug to help people get, uh, manage opioid withdrawal is called lofexidine and that's not an opioid. So the fact that, get, that it can help with opioid abuse does not mean it's an opioid. Bluntly, mitragynine, which is Kratom's most active alkaloid, it's like what can mitragynine, mitragynine is to Kratom, what caffeine is to coffee. 
and in fact, it has some caffeine-like effects. Mitragynine is not an opioid by law. Botanical origin, chemistry, or pharmacology. So when somebody says it's an opioid, it's just not true by any standard, or we wouldn't be here. If it was an opioid, it would automatically be scheduled because that's why the Controlled Substances Act works. It is the most abundant alkaloid. It has a low affinity for opioid receptors. So it's a substance that can have some effects that help people with opioids. It has some opioid-like effects, including helping manage pain. But as Dr. Hustis will show in a few minutes, under even extreme conditions, it does not produce respiratory depression. So the two signature effects of opioids that contribute to the opioid crisis in our country are number one, the highly addictive euphorian properties of opioids. Number two, the respiratory depressing effects. Kratom does not produce those. Next slide, please. So our eight-factor analysis that I mentioned earlier, we looked at everything that's been done on Kratom related to its abuse potential and safety. And these include sophisticated receptor binding studies, imaging studies, clinical studies and field studies in Southeast Asia, and a, one of the largest clinical studies ever done with Kratom by far that Dr. Hustis will talk to you about. So if you hear somebody say, well, we don't really know much about Kratom, I guess they're not looking at the literature because the literature is, has hundreds of studies and more than a hundred in the last uh, five years and including clinical studies and surveys. We know a lot about Kratom. Next slide. Uh, the abuse potential assessment found some of the things that Mac Haddow has already mentioned. It, people don't use opioids for energy and alertness or to increase their focus on the job. That's one of the main reasons they use Kratom in place of coffee or in addition to coffee. Uh, can you get dependent or have withdrawal in Kratom? Well, some people do, but the vast majority don't. Of the people that do, it's generally milder, shorter lived and self-manageable. And animal studies show the same thing. It's not, does not produce an opioid type of withdrawal. That's just a, a myth. Now the science dis, uh, dispels the myth. Uh, so the other thing is that when it was originally recommended for emergency scheduling, that is based on something causing, providing an imminent threat or risk to public health. There is no federal survey that shows that Kratom poses an imminent risk to public health, nor that Kratom is a gateway to drugs of abuse. Rather, the opposite is evident. It is a path away from opioids and other substances of abuse. Next slide. So we've already summarized these. Uh, uh, findings, and I suggest that you take a look at the update on Kratom Science that Mac Caddo mentioned earlier that we will be providing to you. And that provides references and science, and it's distilled in a few pages. Next slide, please. Now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Hustis to show you some very exciting new studies that uh, really bring a lot of this home. Dr. Hustis. Thank you so much, Dr. Henningfield. It's lovely to speak with you all this afternoon and tell you some of the latest advances. This study is one that Dr. Henningfield and Dr. Rodericks and I uh, conducted. The Center for Plant Science and Health, which is a nonprofit associated with the American Kratom Association, actually funded this study, but one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that they had no input in the design of the study, in the conduct of the study, and we actually first provided the results of the study by briefing the Food and Drug Administration and the National Institute 
on drug abuse before we even shared uh, the results of the study. Next, please. The FDA actually published a study saying, if you're going to study the respiratory depressing effects of opioids, we recommend that you do the study in this way. So we took those that guidance and we evaluated very high doses of Kratom, starting at low doses all the way up to 400 milligrams per kilogram doses that are much higher than we see uh, in humans. And we compared it to the um, serious respiratory depressing effects that we know accompany oxycodone. 6.75 is like a therapeutic dose of this uh, analgesic and the 60 and the 150 doses are much higher. And we followed this protocol that included measurement of respiratory depression by blood gases in the rat uh, rats enrolled in the study. Next. And what we were able to show in all the different measures of respiratory health is that oxycodone at the higher doses showed very severe reduction in oxygen saturation. And you can see that here on the left side in green. Whereas even the highest doses of the metragenine, all the way up to 400 milligrams per kilogram, had no significant effect on any of our respiratory measures. Next, please. So we uh, also unfortunately had two deaths, one at each of the high oxycodone doses, where we did not have any deaths, even at the highest metragenine dose. And yet we were able to see some of the effects we expected to see of metragenine, that primary compound in Kratom that produces these effects. So this is a, a very recent study published showing uh, no significant respiratory depression at high doses of metragenine. Next, please. Now, one of the things that the FDA has had most concern about is the lack of human data. And so uh, this study involved almost 200 participants. It is by far the largest and most comprehensive Kratom uh, study to date. It involved three different Kratom preparations, four different doses, and it was very intensive. We had more than 30 inpatient visits over 47 days, and we looked at both single doses and 15 days of repeated dosing. This study has been completed. However, we're still analyzing the data, uh, just the highest doses. We haven't even received the data to evaluate yet, but these data are coming and we are uh, happy and excited to share this information with the FDA. Please, next slide. And you can see how comprehensive it is here. We looked at but not only respiratory health, but liver and kidney and uh, how the blood system, chemistry, and neurological effects. And of the neurological effects, the data that I can share with you today is on uh, cows and sows, which I'm going to explain next, please. So we looked in these 200 individuals at the abuse liability uh, data, and we used very well-validated, scientifically accepted measures of the abuse potential and the potential for withdrawal from the 15 days of kratom dosing. And these are called cows, the clinical opiate withdrawal scale, and sows, the subjective opiate withdrawal scale. And what you can see is that we showed no abuse liability or withdrawal measure 
giving up to a thousand milligrams of kratom for 15 consecutive days. And these data were recently presented at the College on Problems of Drug Dependence. Next, please. Now, another major concern, and one of the ones that the FDA has voiced a considerable concern about is the uh, possibility of kratom overdose deaths. And what's so important that with the long history of use in Southeast Asia, there is not a single death that was attributed only to kratom. And in fact, in the research that's gone on in the United States, looking at potential overdose deaths, there are very few that involve kratom alone. And in most of those cases, there was incomplete toxicology testing looking for the presence of other respiratory depressants. In cases where there was kratom present, in almost all of these cases, there were major opioids present drugs like oxycodone, like fentanyl, and other novel new designer opioids that are very toxic and have a lot of respiratory depression. So one of the key things that we need to go forward is to have uniform criteria for the toxicological testing and research on Kratom's effects. Next, please. Now, we also know there's a tremendous need for regulatory oversight and quality control. And the FDA is who we always turn to in the United States to protect us uh, and to provide this oversight. Unfortunately, right now, we don't have Kratom consumers protected against the adulteration. There are literature studies showing when Kratom has been adulterated by adding the more potent 7 hydroxy or even in Sweden, there were nine deaths because the Kratom product was adulterated with a potent opioid drug. And there also can be problems with heavy metals or microbial. So that is why the Kratom Consumer Protection Act is now law in uh, seven U.S. states, and it's under consideration in many more in order to provide this oversight that currently we are not receiving from the FDA. Next, please. So in conclusion, from all of this new science that we've just given you a small look at some of the new studies, the science of what we know of the pharmacology of Kratom has advanced tremendously since 2017. Kratom offers the potential for harm reduction in the midst of this terrible opioid epidemic that is claiming so many American lives now. The eight-factor analysis shows the need for regulation, but not scheduling. And as I said, the FDA is the appropriate agency to provide that. So until that occurs, we look to state and local governments to protect consumers by passing the KCPA in their state. We also, there's tremendous interest in looking at Kratom and Kratom analogs as potential pain treatments that don't come along with the high abuse liability and the respiratory depression that opioids uh, unfortunately come with. And so we need these new national standards uh, that would enable us to learn more and to be able to debunk these purported kratom related deaths uh, so that we need that complete toxicology and the human research on the effects of kratom on respiration, which we have a lot to share uh, as soon as we can release the results from our large study. And now I'll turn it back over to Mac. Uh, thank you. And, and thanks to, to Dr. Henningfield, Dr. Eustace, uh, to Jim Carroll, uh, for their excellent presentation. I am asked all the time by state legislators and local government officials, 
why the FDA has this problem with Kratom. And I think the parallel to this is found in the experience that the American people had in dealing with the FDA's bias against dietary supplements and herbal supplements. It started in the mid 1950s and only concluded after decades of tension between the dietary supplement consumer community and the FDA, where the FDA continually claimed that the dietary supplements were killing people. They claimed that the dietary supplements were, were illicit, that they had contaminants in them, and that they were dangerous. And it finally took the United States Congress, who in an unprecedented fashion, in a unanimous vote, passed the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act in 1994. And what that legislation did is it limited the FDA's ability to interfere with consumer access to safe dietary supplement products. It put into place a regulatory scheme that assured that the American public, when they purchased a dietary supplement, that it passed GMP standards. And that's unfortunately the very same conundrum we face today with Kratom. The FDA was wrong about dietary supplements and herbal supplements, and they're wrong about Kratom. And so what it has taken is the United States Congress now has to intervene. And we have the, uh, the benefit now of the Federal Protect Consumer Access to Kratom Act that was filed a week and a half ago by Congressman Mark Pocan, a Democrat from Wisconsin, Senator Mike Lee, a, a Republican from Utah, and Senator Cory Booker, a Democrat from New Jersey. We expect when this legislation is refiled in the upcoming legislative session that there will be numerous co-sponsors in a bipartisan and bicameral way that will join this legislation that will enact needed regulations on the FDA to compel them to appropriately regulate Kratom to ensure that consumers in America have access to safe Kratom consumer products. And that is going to be an essential change uh, in the way that, that these products are regulated, much like the dietary supplement industry is regulated today. Despite the FDA's opposition, dietary supplements are used by more than 80% of Americans today. And it represents about a $60 billion contribution to the American economy, safely consumed, safely manufactured, with appropriate guardrails and procedures in place to identify when there are products that are inappropriately entered into the marketplace. That's what we need in the Kratom community. So with that, I'll turn it over now to our panel of legislators, uh, Speaker Pro Tem Kennedy and Senator uh, Bramble, to uh, ask any questions they might have from the lens of a state legislator that you might have for these individuals, the experts who have joined our call. Mac, a question that I would have, we, we've already heard about the FDA and the role they play. We've also <laughs> heard today about uh, the National uh, Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, which I assume is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. So we've got a truncated process at the federal level there. Um, it, it, how much authority does FDA have in trying to overrule what goes on at the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, if any? So let me ask Jim to respond to that question first, and then the others can join in. Yeah, um, thank you, Representative Kennedy. The you know With a substance like this, the ability to control it is done through a joint interagency process. And the it, it's a combination of representatives from the Department of Justice, primarily the Drug Enforcement Administration, as well as HHS, because those are the two entities charged with the responsibility, both from a scientific as well as a legal perspective, as to whether or not a substance should be a, listed as a controlled substance. As the drugs are, um, it's my opportunity or my um, ability to be the convenor, to bring those agencies to the table to make a decision. And while I can't comment on any specific deliberations that took place, um, I will point back to what Mac had to say, which is this issue did come up for consideration. Um, allegedly, um, publicly, um, it's been stated um, while I was the US drug czar um, and the uh, as we know, there was no act, such action taken to um, control this. And, and the other question I would have, based on the fact that at the present time, there hasn't been 
any recorded case that we can find here in the United States or even in the Asian countries where much of the kratom is grown in which kratom single-handedly has been the agent that has somehow caused death. From what I have been told, the most likely reaction if someone is strictly dealing with kratom is an upset stomach or perhaps they might vomit. Uh, does that seem to be the strongest indications of what somebody might experience if in fact they utilize in that to try to get themselves off of uh, one of the opioids that have been developed. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would like to jump in on that one because I also have background as a forensic toxicologist. And I would, I would not agree with um, what you were just saying, Representative Kennedy, in that what we, what we have a problem is, is that we don't have the complete toxicology. So there are cases where they only test for kratom. And so they only test for the kratom and they don't know what else could have been there. So we, when they did, the uh, Center for Disease Control took all the cases that the FDA said were kratom deaths. And in all but seven, they found other potent respiratory depressants when they retested them. They found blood from four of those remaining seven cases where they could still get the blood. And in each of those, they found other respiratory depressant drugs. But there are cases out there that um, only has kratom. And we need, that's why we need to do better at doing the toxicology cases because what's happening now is you know the FDA stated it was an imminent uh, uh, danger for our country despite it not being reported on any of our federal surveys. You know the Dawn studies, the monitoring the future studies, all of these studies that we use. But what would be the reaction to someone uh, if they're strictly taking kratom? And they take too much. What All right. So the you're you're right. In many ways, it might be very mild, but we don't have the answer to that question because the high doses, uh, someone may abuse it and they may take high doses. And we that's why all of this research is so critical. And that's why we've just completed this study where we looked at respiratory, we looked at liver disease, kidney disease, all of these things. And what I think is critical right now is whenever we hear that there's a kratom associated death and think about it, what they do is they go into the home or where they find the person who has passed and they find Kratom there. And Kratom may have been what they were using to try to reduce opioid testing. They may test for just the common opiates, but we have many, many drugs that I think you know about. Fentanyl is killing most of the people in these opioid deaths. And there's many different uh, fentanyl analogs that you have to do very specific tests on. So Kratom, that's why we're doing the research so that we can answer your questions. But right now, as Dr. Henningfield was saying, the abuse liability of Kratom compared to any of these other opioids is much, much lower. The respiratory depression, it doesn't work the same way that the opioids do. So we're trying to provide the scientific data to answer all of these questions. And, and let me just very quickly, uh, Representative Kennedy, you mentioned nausea and upset stomach. Those are the most common reactions that are reported in surveys. Now, the good news about them is that what happens is that people get a little nauseated if they push, take too much, and they back off. And one person commenting to DEA said, uh, nature got it just right. I take too much. I feel sick to my stomach, I, so I don't take that much. So it's a nice safety check. 
Uh, there's been a lot of attention to the 107,000 drug overdose deaths last year. And uh, Jim Carroll mentioned that the vast majority were opioid, in fact, nearly 90,000. The rest were stimulant, sedative. It's a fair question to ask how many of those were attributed to Kratom. We are not aware that any of those 107,000 met the criteria and actually were counted by CDC. And if you look at, at all of the detailed reports, Kratom isn't mentioned. And the criteria that they have for how do they decide which ones were fentanyl, which ones were sedatives, which ones were methamphetamine. The criteria that Dr. Houston mentioned has not been satisfied for any of those deaths with Kratom. So none of us are saying you could not overdose. I mean, you, there are overdose deaths with caffeine, even and water, water, even and water. water. <laughs> so it's, you know, never say never, but the signal is very weak. Kratom is a path away from opioids, a much safer alternative. Mac, could you no, go back to- Kurt, just before we get to you, I would add one important thing that I think Jim Carroll touched on when we he talked about how the Office of uh, National Drug Control Policy would would gather all of the relevant agencies and try to get a consensus position and referee some of the differences. And what we have with Kratom is that that system didn't work because the FDA and their stubborn, uh, persistent attitude about ant being anti-Kratom, NIDA took a different path. And today, NIDA is vocally disputing, as is the secretary of HHS himself, disputing the FDA's position on Kratom. And that is tragic when you think about the purpose for which these agencies exist to protect the public health. And we ought to be looking at harm reduction tools, which Kratom demonstrably has been an effective tool for many people to wean off of more dangerous and addictive substances. So I think that's critically important to get put in context when we talk about what the federal policy should be. I cut you off, Senator Bramble, I apologize. Oh no, that's fine. Uh, when you said uh, we, we should be able to interrupt, I had my hand raised uh, for some time. Oh, I, I, uh, I wasn't watching that, watch I apologize. <laughs> no, no problem. Go back to slide nine if you would. Because I, I want to touch on something that has been one of the biggest challenges in the debate in the public square, the debate in legislatures. On Slide nine. I'm on nine now. Which is this? No, nope, keep going back. No. Well, it was slide nine on my deck. Um, this one right here. The inaccurate. No, the inaccurate FDA. The, go back to the last. No. Nope forward. You had it three ago. It's one that talks about uh, inaccurate information uh, from the FDA. Nope. Keep going. I'll keep looking here. <laughs> one more. This inaccurate FDA data republished by numerous medical groups. This, this one right here. Okay. Yeah. This has been the biggest challenge, and I'll give an example that we experienced in Wisconsin. It's not just the uh, FDA putting out inaccurate information that is republished by various groups, including Mayo, WebMD, et cetera. We have other agencies that are, that are creating misinformation. For example, in Wisconsin, the uh, president of the Sheriff's Association testified in committee uh, dealing with Kratom that uh, virtually every OWI uh, operating while intoxicated uh, case in Wisconsin since Kratom was banned, that virtually every case was directly attributable to Kratom. It's just that they couldn't prove it because the uh, state toxicology lab didn't screen for Kratom, but they knew that every impaired driver that received an OWI citation was the direct result of abuse of Kratom. That was their testimony in chief. Now I'm, I'm condensing it and summarizing, but that was the message. Immediately following that, uh, the president of the Sheriff's Association's testimony, the director of the state uh, toxicology lab corrected the record and said that from the time that Wisconsin banned Kratom 
every OWI screened for Kratom and that they didn't have evidence of one case where Kratom was a sole antagonist that would have contributed to the uh, operating while intoxicated. And the reason that I mention this, one of the biggest challenges that we have, we had it in Utah, we have it in every state that is looking to adopt what we did in Utah. And that is not only do we have inaccurate information from the FDA, but there are other groups that are essentially fabricating new misinformation and taking it as fact. And another point I want to, uh, on, on that uh, regard, uh, Dr. Hughes or Dr. Uh, Henningfield, uh, one of the challenges that I've seen in my travels, not only, uh, as Dr. Houston's pointed out, do they screen for Kratom and don't do a thorough uh, screening for other substances, but how many cases are, was there no toxicology report at all, and yet one of the, the decedent's relatives uh, would report that it was a Kratom death, um, and it's just anecdotal, uh, based on Kratom either being present in the home or the, uh, a relative knowing that the individual uh, might have been taking Kratom, but there's no toxicology to even um, back it up. It seems to me that that is another source of misinformation on Kratom deaths. Could, could either of you comment on that? Well, I, I will comment. Uh, it, that's very interesting um, because I have not seen that. Where they have called it a Kratom death, Kratom was one substance found. And, and as I said, they found it in the home, they looked for it. But it's interesting, I'm on the, the, uh, the group of toxicologists that put out what drugs you should test for when you have a death or when you have an intoxication, an impaired driving case. And uh, metragenine uh, in Kratom has such low prevalence that we don't even consider it a tier one drug where we tell toxicology labs, you should test for it, okay? So its incidence is very low. So what generally what has to happen is we need to consider whether or not we need to get this move to tier one. And it usually, if they find it in the home, they will try to do the testing, but they have to send it out because most laboratories don't do it. And that means money. And when you're in a case and you have to pay for the testing to be done at a reference lab, it's not always done. And you don't do the complete testing. You only do the minimum. And that's where we've run into problem. Uh, Mac may know of other cases where they've claimed it's Kratom. No, no case should be signed out as related to any substance unless they have documented it with good toxicology. So it may be anecdotal. I've seen news stories. I have seen news stories where they, they suggest it was Kratom death without ever doing testing, but I haven't seen a, a death certificate that's done that. Okay, I, Can I, I, have a I have a technical question dealing with and this may get into a, an area of, uh, there's litigation, a couple of litigation. Uh, uh, well, I know of a, a few cases where uh, 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 enterprising attorneys are suing saying Kratom was the cause of death. Is there any standard today, medical standard for acute metrogeny toxicity that, that you're aware of? There's absolutely that, that's a term, none. There's none. That is, a, that is a term that was used specifically in a, a lawsuit that was filed, uh, and you're, you and Dr. Henningfield are two of the nation's experts in this arena. Does that standard even exist? No. There's an as uh, Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, Gurwa spoke. He said there is disagreement among reputable scientists, and there's absolutely no agreement on what is even a kratom intoxication or a kratom death. So that's why we need much more research in this area. And we are so excited because in the new study, we have all the pharmacokinetic data on metragenine from three different kratom formulations that we will be able to look and say, look, this person was walking around doing their job with no problem with these concentrations. Because in some cases, 
the kratom concentrations are very low and they're still saying cause of death. So we have a lot more work to do. Let, let me add to that. So Senator Bramble, you would think it would be easy to know, right? What's the LD50, the overdose, the poise, the death that causes, dose that causes death. The reason we don't know is because there's been a lot of studies with animals where they literally tried to kill the animals by pushing the dose. It turns out that Kratom, it is very difficult to kill animals with any dose. And as we found in the respiratory study, it's easy to overdose and kill animals and do euthanasia with opioids, alcohol, sedatives. Uh, so again, it doesn't mean that there's no risk. It means that, that the answer to your question is, there is anybody that says this was a, a, an overdose death by Kratom and it was at a, a lethal dose, I don't know what they're talking about. There isn't a lethal dose. And to go back to DEA, DEA has a national forensic laboratory reporting system. So it picks up, was Kratom present? Well, guess what? The signal is so low that since 2016, it doesn't even report, hasn't even reported that it was uh, found. And it, they have never listed Kratom in its annual national drug threat report. So legislators and others will say, well, don't they list it as a substance of concern? Well, they've done that for about oh, seven, eight, nine years now. Why? They're doing their job. They, you know, they, they see that it's out there, so they're monitoring, but it has never been listed in the national drug threat. Well, the, the, the point that I was trying to make and, and emphasize here, as we talk about public policy and Kratom, uh, Mac, maybe you'd comment on the, the cases that you and I have discussed where Kratom was reported by a relative, but then toxicology reports were uh, withheld or uh, rejected uh, simply in favor of the anecdotal uh, description rather than any uh, hard evidence of even the presence of, of Kratom in the decedent. Well, the, the problem that we run into, and I think that, uh, that Dr. Eustace correctly pointed out that it's very difficult sometimes given the reports from the first responders who then say, well, we saw Kratom or received a report that from the family that the individual was using Kratom and that allows people to leap to the conclusion yes. that Kratom was a cause of death or, re, or a, a, a associated with it. Uh, one example is particularly compelling. Uh, a mother called me whose son had died and she said that uh, she found him after a couple of days of his being non-responsive to her request to call her. Uh, she went to his apartment and found him dead. Uh, she called the first responders, they showed up, the medical examiner showed up and noticed that there was a package of Kratom on the nightstand, and he asked the mother about it. She explained that her son had suffered from addiction problems, and that he had found Kratom, and that, that had weaned him off of these more uh, dangerous substances, and had saved his life. And she explained that that week prior to his death, that he had been complaining of chest pains, which he thought were associated with COVID, and that he had gone to the doctor on that Friday afternoon. Uh, she found him on a Sunday. Uh, the medical examiner said, well, I'm going to call this a Kratom death. And she said, how can you say that? And she complained and objected vigorously. And then he said to her, well, okay, it's going to take us eight to 12 weeks to get the uh, test results back from the laboratory that we use in order to screen for these substances. So we won't know until then, but uh, so I'm just gonna leave this open. The next morning, she received a call from the chief medical examiner in that county, and he informed her that he was classifying this as a Kratom death. And she said, how can you do that when you know, and your associate told me that you don't have the, the blood work back from the lab for another eight to 12 weeks? He said, I'm disregarding that because I have seen the FDA's warnings about Kratom, and I have worked with the laboratory with which we work and for which we have contracted in order to do the toxicology screens. And they're convinced that Kratom is a cause of death. So I'm calling it a Kratom death. That case is now being litigated. 
because the mother wants to find the truth. She wants to determine how any medical examiner could responsibly conclude that Kratom was a, a cause of death or even a, 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 participant, a, a participant substance in the death when there was no talk screen available to that medical examiner at the time that he drew the conclusion. Unfortunately, that's what we're seeing within the medical examiner community where you have this pervasive disinformation that has influenced them in a way that allows them to, to leap to conclusions for which no science exists nor to document it. And Dr. Eustace said it right. There is no data that shows what the toxic level of kratom is so that they could say this is an absolute kratom death. It has to be evaluated in context of the medical conditions of the individual, the volume of kratom they were taking and other substances they were taking with kratom in order to get a good picture of what that death might be constituted uh, in terms of the role that kratom may or may not have played in the medical problem that that person uh, experienced. Another good example is the one of the, the legal cases been filed against kratom processors talked about how there were no illegal substances found in the toxicology screen by the coroner in the state of Georgia for this particular death. The inquiry that was made of the uh, plaintiff's attorney was, well, what other substances were there? And so the attorneys immediately amended their complaint and said, well, the individual was using a prescribed antihistamine and a, a prescribed antidepressant. You just have to do a simple Google search of those two substances and what they say is that they are contraindicated because they can call car cause cardiac arrhythmia and death in rare cases. The person's cause of death on his, uh, his autopsy report was cardiac failure due to metrogeny. Well, why wouldn't it have been cardiac failure due to the concurrent use of two contraindicated prescription medications that are known to cause cardiac arrest? And the answer to that is that the coroner is leaping to a judgment that's popular with the FDA and popular with the testing laboratory because that allows them to continue to market to these local jurisdictions that when you test, let us add the expense of a Kratom test along with it. That's not okay. good science. So, so I, have to, fight. I have to jump in because I, I want to defend uh, medical examiners and coroners in that most do a very good job and most would never call a death without having the toxicological proof. So uh, I, I think there are examples that um, you know could occur as you've talked about, Mac, but the problem is not so much that. The problem is not doing full testing to see what else might be there, not considering the other drugs, and then leaping to conclusions that any amount of metragenine could produce death. And those are the, the, more, the more substantial problems rather than the occasional um, you know, anecdotal one, because in almost all cases, they are you know, independently trying to do that. They are certainly aware of all of the information that's come out from the FDA about causes of death, but they should be aware of the CDC report and the other reports that have shown that those were inaccurate in many cases. In fact, some of the ones that were listed as kratom uh, caused deaths were motor vehicle fatalities that were serious. So I, I don't want to leave it with the wrong impression that medical exam all medical examiners or most medical examiners and coroners are uh, not doing it. The problem is we don't have the data on the appropriate interpretation of what those results mean. Dr. Yeah, Houston, uh, we actually had an experience very that, that supports what you were saying. Uh, we were on a conference call with uh, a state uh, dire uh, medical examiner, the director of the Medical Examiners Association, who was telling us that the FDA had contacted the Medical Examiners Association and demanded that they screen only for Kratom and that they then uh, report every death as a Kratom death. And the Medical Examiners Association, the director of the Medical Examiners Association rejected that. They said, no, that doesn't meet the standards. And that, that supports exactly what you were just saying. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, and, and it's a fair point, uh, Dr. Eustace. To, you're right. The, the, in the same way that the FDA gets it right most of the time on substances, 
it's the outlier when they get it wrong. And I think it's true in the medical examiner field too, with respect to Kratom. Uh, and, and we can't discount the FDA's uh, obviously influence. And, and I remember that when we uh, subpoenaed, or I'm sorry, didn't subpoena, we FOIA'd the FDA's 44 alleged deaths and received the autopsy reports on 43 of them. It took an enterprising reporter to ferret out that last autopsy report, which the FDA had claimed was not releasable because the family had imposed a HIPAA restriction, which is the privacy law in the United States that protects against the release of, of uh, materials like that or documents like that. And, uh, and so we accepted that. But the reporter called me and said, the, the FDA was lying to you. Uh, I've got the autopsy report. I got it from the FDA. There's no HIPAA restriction on it. I got it from a different database. They just didn't want to release it. And I asked him, I said, well, what does it say? And he said, read it in my article. And in the article in the Huffington Post, Nick Wing disclosed that the FDA, as one of their 44 deaths, reported on this individual who had died of two gunshot wounds to the chest because he was involved in a drug sting. And the police had shot him because they thought he was going for a weapon. And he had ingested a Kratom tea earlier in the day. And the FDA called that a Kratom caused death. That, I think, is indefensible. Uh, and yet that's where we are in this particular situation of trying to ferret that out. Uh, let me take a moment to note that Representative Christopher Nelly has been on for a while. Uh, we didn't recognize him. And uh, he did join us after having some emergency that delayed his getting on. But welcome, Representative Christopher Nelly. Uh, he was the sponsor of the Kratom Consumer Protection Act, which passed uh, in, in, in overwhelming margins in Missouri. Uh, we had a little hiccup with the governor who was advised uh, uh, with some inaccurate information from the FDA about Kratom, and he vetoed that bill. We're looking forward to getting it passed this next year. But welcome, Representative Christopher Nelly, and, and would uh, welcome any comments you want to make at this time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mac. Um, like you mentioned, uh, we got overwhelming support, both in the Missouri House and the Missouri Senate, it was one of the few things uh, in the session that everybody agreed on, uh, and that's because uh, we have been working on this bill for several years, and we had many committee hearings where we brought forth, uh, you know, not only people from the business community, but also the scientific community to uh, talk about the effects of, of Kratom on uh, public health, and uh, the legislature was generally convinced that uh, there was uh, a need for a safe and legal regulatory framework for the sale of this uh, substance. And, um, you know, unfortunately, after we got the bill passed uh, through the legislature, um, it got to the governor's desk. And uh, having not had the uh, privilege of sitting through those committee hearings, uh, the governor staff, it looks like, uh, did some quick Googling online and drew a hasty conclusion and advised the governor to veto the bill, which he did. Uh, and so uh, we're going to have to take another bite at the apple here in the upcoming legislative session. And uh, hopefully we can spend a little more time educating uh, folks in the executive branch about uh, the science behind uh, Kratom and its effects on, on public health. And hopefully we can, uh, in fact, pass the Credit Consumer Protection Act into law in the upcoming session. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you for that comment. We've reached the bewitching hour. Uh, we want to thank all of the participants, uh, particularly Dr. Eustace, Dr. Henningfield, uh, Jim Carroll, the legislators who participated as a panel to, uh, to provide questions. Uh, we're grateful for uh, all of you in giving a good overview to state legislators and local public health officials about the true state of science on Kratom and how they can use this information to evaluate the next steps that they might have in uh, enacting what we hope are parallel Kratom Consumer Protection Act or ordinances that can protect consumers so they know that they are ingesting and purchasing safe Kratom products. So thanks to everyone. We look forward to a, a robust 2023 and we certainly wish to all of you the happiest of New Year's as we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.